you know, people talk about AGI, yeah. right? Artificial general intelligence. Yeah. Do you think in 10 years from now we are there? Uh, by depending on how you define it, I think the answer is yes. And so the question is, what is AGI? Um, a, if we define AGI as uh, a piece of software, a computer that can take a whole bunch of tests, and these tests uh, reflect uh, basic intelligence, um, and uh, uh, and by achieving by 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 completing those tests, uh, deliver results that are. Uh, fairly, fairly competitive to a normal human. Um, I would, I would say that within the next five years, you're going to see uh, um, obviously uh, AIs that can that can achieve those tests and now, design the, the chips that you're making right now. Yeah, yeah. Will you need to have the same staff that designs them? Uh, in fact, uh, none of our chips are possible today without AI. Literally, the H100s we're shipping today was designed uh, with the assistance of a whole lot of AIs. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to cram so many transistors on a chip or optimize the algorithms to the level that we have. And you know, software can't be written without AI. Chips can't be designed without AI. Nothing can, yeah, nothing's possible. I, I think what's going to happen is we're going to have we're going to have um, uh, off-the-shelf AIs, and these off-the-shelf AIs are going to be really, really good at at, at um, solving a lot of problems. Uh, but but you're going to have uh, 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 companies in healthcare are going to have supervised, you know, super tuned. AIs that take these off-the-shelf AIs and make them super good at drug discovery or super good at chip design. Let me just use our, our company for example. The vast majority of our company's value is in the data and the intelligence and the, the know-how, the craft that's inside our company. And so I've got to take a, a really smart AI, which is what we do. We build a smart AI, and then we teach it how to design chips. We teach it how to write software. You know, we teach it how to you know, do drug discovery. You'll teach it how to do you know, radiology. Let me ask you a geopolitical question. We're going to hear from the uh, president of Taiwan uh, just after this. And there is a big debate, as you know, about chip independence, uh, the big investment that we're making in chips to manufacture here in the United States, mm -hmm. um, whether we should be exporting certain types of chips uh, to China. Mm -hmm. Where are we on the journey of being chip independent, if you will? And do you think that that is a worthy goal? We are, we are somewhere between a decade to two decades away from, from supply chain independence. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our system comes 35,000 parts, and eight of them come from TSMC. And the supply chain, when you think through it... And they're in Taiwan, of course. Yeah, there are a lot in Taiwan. They're all over the world. But supply chain independence is going to be really challenging. Yeah. We should try it. We should endeavor it. I mean, we, we should absolutely go down the journey of it. But... Total independence of supply chain is, is not a real practical thing for, for a decade or two. Okay. One of the other things that's happening, as you know so well, is that the U.S. government uh, has effectively told you, you need to throttle uh, the speed of the chips yeah. uh, that you are exporting to China. Yeah. This is having an impact on the business itself. But I'm curious how you think about that also uh, geopolitically as a business, you know, what companies you should do business with. Should you do business with people in China or not? given all of the concerns that people have? Well, on first principles, we're a company that was built for business. And so we try to do business with everybody we can. Um, on, the other hand, on the other hand, our national security matters and our national competitive, competitiveness matters. Um, somewhere between, between, the, the, between that makes sense. And so our regulations provide for that. Uh, the most critical technology that we build, uh, the leading edge of it, uh, is not made available to China. And so what, our, what we have to do, a new regulation just came out, uh, one that came out a year ago, one just came out this year. And so we have, to, we have to come up with new chips that comply with the regulation. Um, and once we comply with the regulation, we'll go back to market and, and do the best. But do you think the regulation is a good idea? Because I have, I have heard you say that you think potentially by throttling these chips, we are just inspiring and creating competitors in places like China that you can't control. That's what, you know, look, there are always unintended consequences. Everything that we do uh, in complicated systems, if we want to, want to limit them from access to technology like NVIDIA's, um, maybe it doesn't really. Uh, they, they find a way to get it or they find a way to uh, inspire their local industry. There's some 50 companies that are being built uh, in China that, that uh, are going to go provide this technology. So we, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. And so 
what can you do? Um, well, you can, you can make your own choices. But the, the other thing that's happened literally in the past uh, a couple months now is Huawei uh, came out with a new phone. Yeah. Um, and it surprised everybody in terms of the chips in that phone. In terms of uh, being a seven nanometer chip, there was a view that China was never going to get there. We were, we, we had this sort of real, uh, uh, real opportunity ahead of them by by, by many years. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised by that? Uh, the the rumors of it in, in in the market has been around for a long time, and so uh, was it, were we surprised? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think anybody in the industry was really surprised. And and. Um, is it possible to take something that that said 16 nanometer and shrink it to seven? You know, these are just numbers. Uh, is it really seven? Um, did they shrink it down to something that was sufficiently good that you can make foam from? Yeah, I think so. And and so, so I think it. You know, there, there's no magic in these numbers, as you know. It's just seven. The number. But, but the question is, what is our lead o over them? Do you think? In semiconductors. Yeah. In semiconductors, you know, call it call it a decade, but um, uh, could you take the decade-old technology and just squeeze the living daylights out of it until it produces something that's kind of like something from five years ago? Yeah, probably. And so, so I think there's a lot of in, you know a lot of a lot of clever engineers all over the world, and they're trying to you know get the most out of. Let me ask you a different the company. They have. Um, I want to ask you a management question um, because it's just fascinating given the success of, of this. Of this company, uh, you constantly say, even at this point in the ball game, uh, you say, "I do everything I can not to go out of business. I do everything I can not to fail." That that is like a mantra inside the company, even at this point. What is that about? Uh, what is that about? I, I think I think when you when you build a company from the ground up and you you experience real real adversity and. Uh, uh, and you really, really experience nearly going out of business several times, uh, that, that feeling stays with you. Um, I wake up every morning in, in, in you know, some condition of concern, and, and uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't wake up proud and confident. I wake up worried and concerned about, you know, and so, and so, so I, I live in this condition where, where um, uh, partly, partly, you know, partly desperate, partly, you know, partly, partly uh, aspirational. And okay, well, let me ask you then about this. Uh, you said this to the New Yorker, and um, I found it fascinating. Again, goes to this idea of failure or, or worries about failure. Um, you said, I find that I think best when I'm under adversity. And then you said, my heart rate actually goes down. When I'm under adversity, my heart rate goes up. By a lot. Uh huh. Well, my. <laughs> let's see. Well, I, I think I think um, uh, you know, during adversity you're more focused, and when you're more focused, you get you perform better. And I, I like I like, you know, the last last uh, five minutes before uh, before something you're you're more focused, and so, you know, I, I like to live in that state where where. Uh, uh, we're about to perish, and everything, every, you know, and so, so I, I enjoy that condition, and, and uh, I do my best work in that condition, and I, you know, I like going home and telling my wife I saved the company today, and, and uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it wasn't true, but, but I like to think so. And so, yeah. um, uh, another question: We have a lot of business leaders and CEOs here, and, and I think they're going to be surprised to hear this. You have forty direct reports. So at like the company. 50, 50 direct reports. 50 direct reports. Yeah. Most people say, I don't know if we have any consultants in the room, they'd say, you know what, half a dozen, mm -hmm. maybe 10, that should be the limit. What's your, what's your philosophy or theory here? Well, the people that report to the CEO should require the least amount of pampering. And so I don't think they need life advice. I don't think they need career guidance. Um, they should be at the top of their game, incredibly good at their craft. I, uh, um, and unless they need my personal help, uh, you know, they should require very little management. And so, so I think that one, uh, the more the more direct reports the CEO has, the less layers are in the company. Right. And so, so uh, it allows us to keep information fluid. It allows us to uh, make sure that that everyone is empowered by information. 
uh, and uh, our company that you know just performs better because everybody's aligned, everybody's in informed of what's going on. Uh, I wanted to open up to questions in just a moment, uh, so please do raise your hand so I can I can find you. Uh, but but I want to ask you this: uh, You did a podcast recently, um, and there were a lot of headlines about it. And you said during the podcast, if you could do it all over again, meaning like if you could start Nvidia again, yeah, you wouldn't. No. <laughs> What do you? What did you mean? Why? Yeah. I mean, you've done this yeah. amazing thing. Yeah. You're worth forty billion dollars personally. Yeah. That wasn't what I meant. First of all, uh, you know, I, I think it would be disingenuous if I said that that um, uh, it wasn't quote worth it. Um, I, I, I enjoy a lot a lot of good things in life. I've got a great family. Uh, we built a great company. Uh, it, all of that is worth it. That's, that wasn't what I meant. What I meant was. If people realized how hard something is, and if I would have realized how hard it was, how many times we're going to fail? Uh, if, if I would have known all of the things that that I had to know in order to be a CEO, uh, everything that we had to solve in order to be where we are, that mountain of work, that mountain of you know challenges, that mountain of adversity and setback, and some amount of humiliation and a lot of embarrassment. If you were to mount, piled all of that on in 1993, in, you know, on the table of a 29-year-old, I, I don't think I would have done it. I would, you know, I would have said, "There's no way I would know all this. There's no way I could learn all this. There's no way we can overcome all this. There's no way, you know, th this is a game plan that that's not going to work." And so that that's what I meant. That that I think I think the ignorance of entrepreneurs, the, this attitude that, and I try to, to to keep that today, which is ask yourself. How hard could it be? You know, you approach life with this attitude of how hard could it be? If they could do it, I could do it. That attitude is completely helpful, but it's also completely wrong. It's very helpful because it gives you courage, but it's wrong because it is way harder than you think it is. <laughs> and and uh, uh, the amount of skill that is necessary, the amount of knowledge that's necessary, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it's one of those... Uh, uh, teenager attitudes, and and I think, I think we I try to keep that in the company that teenager attitude. How hard can something can can something be? Um, you know, it gives you courage, it gives you confidence. Jensen Wong, everybody, thank you very very much. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.